in the presentation by uh, Professor Gan, I would like to give a little introduction to the Healthy Site Initiative. Site, uh, combining interdisciplinary and translational expertise is one of the strategic initiatives that Healthy started uh, about uh, two years ago. Uh, the mission of Site is to create collaborative uh, opportunities for diverse technical disciplines to develop innovative new science and also build efficient network to advance science from discovery to application. In recent years, individual, individual scientific area has been highly specialized, and it is often a very time-consuming and a frustrating process to translate the outcomes of basic science to application, which usually involves scientific practitioner of multiple disciplines. Early this year, Cyril Pettig, executive director of HESI, published a policy paper to emphasize the need to develop multilingual scientific practitioners who can facilitate the communications among those who work in our each of highly specialized scientific areas within a silo and accelerate the advancement of the trans translational sciences. With the site initiative, HESI has been seeking partners to help build and implement innovative structures training and opportunities for science and scientists to move research to application. HESI has created and been developing a network of global leaders to expand formal training and experiential opportunities, advance professional development, facilitate exposure to translation across sectors, resource sharing, and changing funding and training models to ensure a good number of multilingual scientists and scientific practitioners are developed to support the growing need of translational science. Today, we have Professor Timothy Gunn given a presentation entitled as Advancing Scientific Innovation in Toxicology Toward Improved Public Health. Professor Gunn is the head of the Department of Toxicology in the Center of Radi Radiation, Chemicals, Environmental Hazards, Public Health England. He holds a professor, professorship in University of Surrey, Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences, and Senior Research Position at Imperial College London. He trained at the School of Pharmacy, University of London, graduating with Bachelor of Science, joint owner with Toxicology in 1985, and PhD in Pharmacology in 1988. After receiving his PhD, he transfers to National Cancer Institute in the USA, for a postdoctoral period followed by visiting staff position. From 1993 to 2011, he has a good group leader. He was a group leader in the Medical Research Council Toxicology Unit and left in 2011 to take up the current position. His talk uh, today was previously given at the HESI site seminar in Eurotalk last September, and it is our pleasure to have uh, Professor Gant for the audience in Asia today. Uh, Professor Gant, I am switching the controls to you. Hello. Can, can you see the slide? Okay, I, I can. Okay. Well, how are you doing? Okay. So it's my pleasure to be with you today, um, and uh, I hope you can see the slide. Okay. Um, so that as as Aki said this uh, in the introduction, this this presentation was first given at, um, at Eurotox uh, about a month ago, um, and it's my pleasure today to give it um, as part of the HESI um, outreach seminar, and, and I'm. Um, very pleased to have been invited to do that, and thank you to HESI for doing so. Um, just to orientate you with the various icons that are all, uh, nomenclatures that are on this screen, um, I work for a new organisation in the UK called Public Health England, 
Um, it's called Public Health England because Public Health Wales and Public Health Scotland have their own public health services, though we all work closely together in, in what is still the United Kingdom, um, but they're differentiated by the term of Public Health England. So we have the Public Health England set up, and that, that was set up a year and a half ago, and that's the organisation for which I now work. Um, research, which is the part that I'm in charge of within Public Health England, is supported under the National Health Service, under their funding scheme of the National Institute for Health Research, so that, that's there. And as like you said, I hold positions in King's College London, Imperial College London, and the University of Surrey, and they're all close academic partners with the, some of the research work we do. So um, just to give you an idea of where we are, just so you can get the geography right, um, I'm actually situated just here. Um, to the west of London on a very large scientific site um, that's uh, located in just south of Oxford University. It's one of four science parks um, in, in the Oxfordshire area down here. So this is where we are. Okay, so what I want to do today is really give quite a high, out, high level outline of the sort of technologies and the challenges which we're facing now in toxicology generally, but particularly in public health toxicology. So. A lot of the things I'll, I'll say today are applicable to pharmaceutical toxicology, but it's orientated more towards the, the chemicals end, um, the chemicals toxicology that we, we have to deal with in public health. So this is the outline today. I want to start with uh, um, just looking at what is public health what and why do we do it. The, the burden of disease, which is really underpins why we're interested in public health and why we do it. And then look very closely at um, association and causation, because um, a lot of the questions and the challenges that we deal with are often dealt with associations and don't necessarily have an underpinning causation. And this is where we've got an opportunity to address things, and it's important in policy development that we start to understand causations um, a little bit better. So, so that's an area I'll, I'll, I'll look at. Then we'll look at the data-rich toxicology. Um, I don't think uh, um, the, the technologies we'll, we'll mention here are going to be anything new to you, but it's worth looking at how we're going to start to integrate those. We've had some of these technologies around for 15 years, and we need to still work out how to use them better. And I'll put those into context in terms of exposure hazard biomarkers, and then have a look at susceptibilities, which I think is a new area creeping up on us, um, and, then, and the way that susceptibility um, influences risk. And then finally, just finish up on the, the interaction of the, of the individual susceptibilities in the environment um, with a summary. And so you can follow where we are. Um, there's a little row of chevrons along the bottom here, which map this, um, this set of markers at the top here. And what I'll do is I'll have these um, lit as we go along as we pass through the various stages. So I hope that will be able to, to orientate you as we go through the slides. So what is public health? Um, Okay, this is an old definition from 1920s that I, I kind of like, and it's given rise to another definition, and you can look on the web and find a number of different variations of this. So this is a more modern definition from the Faculty of Public Health. It's basically based on this one from Winslow of 1920. It's, it's based more around um, microbial disease because um, chemicals weren't such a feature in 1920, but nevertheless it has um, words that are applicable to us today. So public health is the science and art of preventing disease. I think that's important because while we spend a lot of time on thinking about treating disease, um, treating disease is actually relatively expensive. If we can prevent disease, that's a better way of both enhancing life quality um, as well as, as saving money in terms of treatment. So preventing disease, um, of course, associated with that prolonging to life, um, and through organized community efforts. So coming together to make this work, not working as individuals, but bringing, bringing things both in the community and in the science community generally, uh, disciplines together to improve this public health. Um, and the Organization of Medical Nurse Services for early diagnosis, so getting their um, quickly if, if disease occurs, preventative treatment of disease, um, and, and ensuring that, that there's no exclusion. So it's public health is about every individual. It's, it's about overcoming inequalities and making sure that everybody has access to the same level of health standard that they would expect. Um, so a slightly shorter definition of this from the Faculty of Public Health, the science and art of promoting and prevent, protecting health and well-being, preventing ill health and prolonging life through the organized effects of society essentially says the same thing, but in slightly um, better language. So that's, that's what we're aiming to achieve in the public health aspect. Um, this is a slide um, which I started to put together, and I put together for Eurotox. And it, it just indicates some of the areas of um, concern within public health. They're not all on here. And one that was pointed out at Eurotox, which I've not included yet, is in fact food, of course, which is another big area. Um, 
and there are others here which are spot and missing, but they give us some idea of the breadth of public health, the kind of things that we're dealing with. Um, uh, possibly some, the, one of the biggest, without a doubt, is infectious diseases, and I don't think the size of this circle truly represents um, the, the burden of disease from infectious disease. It's by far the biggest area of, of public health. But we've also got things like environmental chemicals, uh, and that I think is a, is a big area. We've got a lot of ongoing queries with, with, with chemicals and, and, and then poisons which are associated but due to the deliberate intake of chemicals. And then we've got things like extreme natural events, climate change, um, and how that affects some of these other things around here. Um, chemical weapons and biological weapons, radiological weapons comes into public health, as well as the two forms of, iron, of, um, of radiation, the ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation. And increasingly now, because of burden disease from things like asthma, we've got allergens on the agenda as well. So I've, I've also ranked these along uh, an axis of public concern, um, and up here in terms of the of the burden of disease that they cause. Now this is very much my own perception. It reflects the kind of background of things ongoing. And we can overlay some of the things which, which are associated with all of these different areas on here. Um, but of course, this is the kind of the, the ongoing area. There are individual incidents which will push these things, uh, these areas are right up the public concern agenda. So they don't always sit around this area. Um, Infectious disease, of course, at the moment is being driven, of course, by Ebola. So it's been re it's been pushed right up the public concern agenda. Um, things like the Fukushima incident pushed ionizing radiation. So the, so where I've put these areas just reflects where they kind of sit in the absence of a, as, of an ongoing emergency. And and I find it quite interesting for infectious diseases, for example, that that doesn't tend to get on the public concern except when we have an emergency like Ebola. Um, which is kind of interesting with some of the problems that are being faced now with with um, resistance to, to antibiotics, which possibly, I think, sit further up here. Environmental chemicals is something that just seems to be ongoing. We always get questions and there's a lot of queries and public concern about um, environmental chemicals, and you can see that most of the um, popular news media every day. So it's very much my own personal perception, but at least it, it gives us a, a, a flavor of the of some of the breadth of public health concern, and really, uh, importantly, the area of science that it covers, which is extremely broad, ranging from everything from bacteria to um, radiation right through to chemicals, so uh, and and climatic events. So, a really broad area of science that that needs to work within the community of, of scientists to bring together a lot of different disciplines to really um, form effective public health. So, why do we do it? Um, well, I'm going to concentrate here more on the chemical side. Um, if we look at chemicals at the moment, um, in, in 1981, at least this, this, these are con these are European uh, derived figures, but we, and approximately we're about 100,000 chemicals are marketed in 1981, um, existing use chemicals, and the OECD of these listed, I checked recently in 2007. Um, just over four and a half thousand as being high volume, so greater than a thousand tons annual, annually. And a lot of these listed as, as mixtures rather than as uh, single chemicals. And and the the thing is that at least prior to reach, uh, probably less than three percent of these have been subject to a complete um, toxicological assessment. Um, so since since uh, reach came in, which is the European legislation on 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 chemicals. Um, some of this data void has been filled, but nevertheless, we've still got a large outstanding um, lack of understanding, really, of, of a number of the chemicals that we have in, in, in use every day. And new technologies are pushing that need to understand along even greater, because as they start to generate more data, in fact, generates more questions, and that's something that we'll look at today. Um, so we've got we've got a lot of of work to do in terms of understanding pre-existing chemicals, and the way that we regulate some existing chemicals, uh, some new chemicals coming and being used. Um, what about um, the global burden of disease that we can associate with chemicals? It's difficult to get really good numbers on this. Um, by far, I think the biggest areas is air pollution, and these these numbers came from this. Um, uh, publication down here um, in 2011. Air pollution largely driven by um, emissions related um, 
emissions related chemicals both from from traffic and from from power generation so so a large board burden of disease coming from that because it, it spreads across continents and across countries and we're all exposed to that and it's, it's uh, um, impossible to avoid it and then we've got acute chemical incidents and exposures um, a less burden but but more significant when they happen they cause a lot more interest um, longer term effects of single chemicals so things used in the environment possibly 11% uh, and um, then occupational exposures down here these ones are easier to control so that so they form less of the burden of disease so they might be more hazardous chemicals and here we've got because it's difficult to control uh, probably a much larger burden of disease it, these numbers are probably not totally accurate but they give us a reflection of where some of the burden lies that we need to look at. We can get perhaps a few more accurate numbers on some um, some disease types and so for example with asthma we know at least in the UK um, there's 5.4 million affected I mean that's some 10 percent of the population one in 12 adults one in 11 children and there's a strong association with the indoor environment and mold and as we'll come back to later probably an early life exposure component um, things to do with the microbiome or early exposure to activate the immune system and, and, and the lifestyle effects and building effects associated with this burden disease so an, an interesting area to look at associated with that allergenic disease um, environmental factors thought to account for 1.6 million cases of allergic rhinitis and three and a half um, three 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 hundred fifty thousand 350,000 cases of skin complaints in the UK Again, early life exposures, um, things that we still need to understand better, um, particularly as we start to develop new building technologies and new ways of heating and cooling buildings in, in order to try and use that less energy. And then we've got um, things that show up very clearly that we're all aware of, uh, meat and glioma associated with asbestos. Autism, um, another uh, disease that's been more prevalent for various reasons possibly some due to diagnosis but again no single identified environmental factor that has been um, associations have been made with environmental factors but the, uh, an accumulated body of evidence um, reviewed by our uh, former organization the health protection agency in 2005 suggested some some environmental involvement particular air pollution we've got much better numbers on um, and at least in the UK, and I think this is reflective uh, across many other countries as well, a contribution to the earlier deaths of up to 200,000 people in 2008, average loss of life of about two years per death affected. Um, lead exposure, again, not mortality effects, but a reduction in IQ scores, and that has a quality of life benefit that we need to be aware of. Childhood cancer, very wide estimates on that one. Um, but probably I think uh, there's some association with, with environmental chemicals. So the list is not exhaustive, but it gives us an idea of some of the burden of disease and some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of um, public health toxicology. So what about the role of toxicology in public health and where does it fit in? Well, public health has largely been very dependent um, on epidemiology. Epidemiology associating um, an exposure um, with an outcome. And in, at least in cases where there's a proven association, and good examples of this are, are the very early association of, for example, scrotal cancer with with um, with uh, with uh, combustion products, and more later things like asbestos and mesothelioma, smoking, and and uh, small cell lung cancer. Where there's a proven association like that, where the exposure can be relatively easily measured, and where the outcome tends to be unusual, so it shows up above the background you can come to this point of having a proven association without knowing causation and in that case um, a proven association can be sufficient to develop a, a policy agenda so a policy to, to reduce the exposure and certainly if you do that what you hope is that your your intervention um, will then show up in, in a changed outcome and, and if that's over a relatively short period of time then you can actually measure that um, effect of that intervention very clearly and thalidomide is a, is a great example of that where you can you had an, an unusual outcome that showed up against the background you had an exposure that you could relatively well quantitate because it's um, a deliberate um, uh, um, dosing uh, and then and then so you could come to a pretty proven association and, and over 12 months you could show that that, um, that intervention had an effect so that that's a, a good example but an unusual one in terms of um, public health so what we usually need to do is to get a bit further down before 
we're usually not in the situation where we can get a good proven association, either because we can't accurately measure the exposure, so we can't do good epidemiology, or we can't assess the outcome um, very easily, or we can't get good measure on the outcome. And there we need the toxicology to come in uh, and and to, um, to to give us more in causation. So the toxicology in public health really ties together these two ends of the, of the epidemiology and the outcome. Um, in terms of epidemiology, we exposure toxicology can give uh, much better measures, hopefully, in, in and underpin the epidemiology um, in terms of better measuring exposure and can better quantitate the outcomes. And then in the middle here, we've got the mechanistic um, mode of action type toxicology, understanding toxicodynamics. That's the, the really the toxicology that underpins the trying to understand causation and can be essential if you're going to um, develop a, a um, a policy intervention there that, that, that you hope is going to have an effect. Um, just to show, we get associations in the news media every single day, and some of them are based on very small cohorts, and they tend to generate quite a lot of interest. And they also generate a lot of confusion. And I think this is one of the problems and the challenges facing um, public health, that we get individual studies appearing in the news media um, showing causation, and, and then next week another one will appear that shows something different. And it, and it confuses the public, and it doesn't help in terms of the public health message. Uh, and, and this is a website from a website that's been circulating around our department, so I took this one out just to show how easy it is to make associations and why we really need toxicology to understand these. So what we're looking at here, and they come from this website down here, is, is the per capita com consumption of cheese and the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bed sheets. And the actual correlation between these two events, so you've got a, an exposure and an outcome here, the, the, the correlation between these two events is, um, is 0.95. Um, so it's so very closely correlated. But of course, we, we probably think this is a spurious association. So would this association justify intervention? I think we'd have to say no, it's not a, a proven association. So what would we do to try and prove this association if we thought there was a relationship? And um, we test this further in the first instance by establishing possibly the actual cheese consumption of those affected, because there's an obvious problem with the exposure measurement here. That you're dealing with it on a per capita consumption, so it's 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 not the people who are affected here, but it's all people. So, so what you really want to know about is the actual people who are affected by this incident here, whether their um, what their consumption was like. Uh, um, uh, so you might want to establish that first, and and then possibly you might want to set up a model system, um, so you can start to look and say, well, actually, in this model system, is there is there an association uh, between the, the the cheese which we can measure as an exposure and this outcome and therefore we can make a um, we can show causation which then might justify some kind of policy so so these are things that we do and I guess one real challenge we face is that associations can be made relatively quickly on, on, on quite small cohorts sometimes and we get published in the news media and get picked up on and um, actually showing that causation can take much longer and so you get a, a time delayed lag that can that can affect the way public the, the public actually respond um, and certainly I, I, we we had an incident not so so long ago here in the UK with with the uptake of the NMR MMR max vaccine um, that was a very well publicized event that, that caused a very um, severe public reaction and, and, and failure to immunize infants that then resulted some years later in an outbreak of measles so so these things happen and and toxicology has got a real challenge here to use all of the new methods and resources available to it to try and get to this this um, proven causation much more quickly and to, to underpin policy. So I think we can establish then that association and correlation does not establish causality. Um, proven association can indicate causation, and, and but this is relatively unusual. So we've, we've gone over a couple of examples. It, it occurs when there's a severe or rare adverse outcome that shows up against background and, and therefore can be easily quantitated. Um, and, so, um, and it also occurs when you can actually measure the exposure well. So a proven association satisfies most of the Bradford Hall, the Bradford Hill criteria and would possibly prevent, would, would give sufficient evidence to justify intervention without showing causation. And that intervention should then show um, reversibility. But as I said, this is this scenario is unusual. 
if there's a high level of background disease state, which is which is often the case, or the exposure or the outcome cannot be accurately assessed or quantitated, or more commonly, if there's a combination mixture event that it's not just a single chemical or a single exposure type that's occurring, um, proving association satisfying the Bradford Hill criteria can be very difficult. Uh, and therefore inferring causation is difficult and therefore you've got difficulties in terms of developing a policy or an intervention um, type um, uh, and it, an intervention that would actually have um, meaningful um, a meaningful outcome so in these cases we need to do better toxicology to start to understand the causation therefore to further understand causation we need studies in model systems and relevance established to humans and so all of the new technology in that, that that's available to toxicology can assist us in this endeavor and, and so improve our toxicological assessment and that's where we need to work to and that's going to be a continuing challenge both as new chemicals and new environmental hazards are identified um, but also as, as technology advances uh, and this is just to indicate why it's important. So um, we've been quite concerned with with particulates in the in the air from combustion products, but it's become apparent that a large number of particulates also arise from other sources. And one of the sources, at least in the traffic, is brake discs. Um, but we've got a problem here. This isn't a single compound. So uh, this is an analysis of of particulates from, from brake discs and from brake pads over here and you can see it constitutes a large number of different elements and don't need to worry about what they are but it's a mixture effect here so so if we want to develop a policy on this basis um, in order to, to reduce the health burden parts of these particulates what are we going to do we're going to ban brake discs well that's going to cause a, a possibly a much higher health burden of doing that so we need to understand which of the components within this system are actually causing the problem and the only way we're going to do that is, is with a um, model system um, toxicology so we start to need to, to break this down to understand whether there's one particular part of this pie here that we can actually um, justifiably develop a policy intervention on that would have a, a beneficial health effect so what about the changing face of toxicology in science? Well, it's being driven by data. Um, we all have a lot of data now, and there's a high level of ability to generate data relatively quickly. Um, so, so we can generate it, and you don't even have to leave your desk now to do this. We can, I, for example, if I wanted to get some sequencing data done, I can, I can take samples and I can send them out to a sequence provider pay the bill and the data will arrive back to me within two or three weeks um, and just transferred by computers and, and it'll be I could get 20 or 30 million or 40 or 50 million reads on a set of data in one go so the data generation is is very easy and very quick more pertinently it's also accessible and it's accessible to everybody so there's a big shift and quite rightly so to make data open access to make data available and so we can all go on to to data banks and we can pull down various lots of data so it's accessible to all people um, whether they've got the ability to interpret that data or not and so we can easily then use that data to make a, a associations and we need to ensure that, that data is being used properly and that presents um, challenges and just to, to give a relatively trivial example of this but um, but it's, but it's um, a pertinent one nevertheless so you may have wondered who who I am you know and who, who why am I lecturing on this HESI seminar today and so of course what you do is you google him we've all done this you, you've met somebody new you need to, to find out who they are um, you don't bother asking people anymore you, you just simply go on to Google and you type them in and see what comes up and and at least this is um, a, a few months old from when I last did it but this is this is what you you may well have pulled up if you put my name in and so you can see here that um, at the top apparently I have a, a, a clothing store um, sells a rather nice range of men's and women's wear clothing up here um, I also have several LinkedIn profiles and there's a few images of me down here um, the question is some of this information is true and some of it's not and if you were trying to take action on this data you could um, take inappropriate action because some of this data is misleading and the misleading parts on here are that unfortunately I don't own a nice clothing store or sell nice clothes in men's or women's wear so that is um, untrue and none of these pictures down here are me so you may have thought I was a 
a good sports star, a relatively good-looking chap, and unfortunately that's not um, necessarily the case. So, so if you were looking for, for me by these pictures, you wouldn't have found me because none of them are true. Some of the things in the middle here are true, um, and if you had acted on those pieces of information, that may have been appropriate, but acting on the top or the bottom wouldn't. So we have easy access to data, um, but it doesn't necessarily lead us to the right actions, and that's that's one of the real challenges for for, pub, for public health. We live in a data-rich environment, um, but not necessarily good. Um, we need good interpretation of that data. So just to outline some of the, the technologies which are driving toxicology, and this is not, not by no means an exhaustive list. Um, I've, I've laid them out here along the toxicological pathway, starting from the external dose, um, going through to the concentration of the target site, to altering physiology, to causing a reversible pathology, and this is where homeostasis comes in, um, to also an, an irreversible apical outcome, an irreversible pathology at the end here. Um, uh, and these are some of the technologies which are impinging on, on this area and allowing us to generate more data. So obviously in terms of assessing dose, external dose, um, we've got the, the, the high resolution, high throughput analytical equipment here which, which can easily um, measure exposures. Um, and as we'll see in a minute, we can measure it, but we don't really know what it means. So we, we can measure quite a lot of exposure, at least in the external environment. It doesn't necessarily reflect what's happening at the target site of action, but here we're developing new mathematical models so we can start to get to better assessments of concentration at target site. In terms of looking at interactions and altered physiology and what's happening in this area, we've got all sorts of new technologies. Um, just because it's pretty, I put a microarray here, but most people are now doing uh, next generation sequencing and, 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 and other technologies here. Um, proteomics, etc., to assess what's happening to physiology. So we can make a lot more measurements a lot more quickly in this area down here. And then down at this end um, where we're starting to see um, effects that are causing uh, irreversible pathology, for example, reduction in energy, depletion of cellular macromolecules, we can start to see this loss of homeostasis through technologies such as, um, such as proton NMR and other such technologies, which allow us to to really assess the assess the pathophysiological outcome much much better. So if we can harness these technologies effectively, we can both quantitate the exposure better, the mechanism in the middle or the mode of action, and and also the 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 adverse outcome down here. And that should give us a much better way of um, assessing and establishing causation and allowing us to build better policy. But it it, it is a question on of us using this data properly. So for example, exposure, we can all very quickly now measure things that we are being exposed to. And this is um, just this is just from a mass spec. Um, it happens to be a urine from somebody in our in our laboratory. And we just ran it down to ran it down the mass spec just to quantitate the system. And and here we can easily pick up three band phthalates. Now you could say they're possibly contamination from from the way the sample is treated, we hope that's not the case because we treated it quite carefully. Um, but either way, what we're looking at is, is a very easy ability to measure three phthalates, which are now on the band list within this urine sample. But it doesn't tell us anything about what that really means in terms of um, risk of an adverse outcome from these from this exposure. So, so we're left here with a piece of data that could easily be of concern to an individual but requires a much better understanding of what these chemicals actually do and how they might understand um, uh, alter physiology. So, so we can build concern very easily by making these kind of measurements very quickly. But we, but that concern um, is not necessarily realistic, and and that's where the public health challenge of toxicology comes in. Um, another example of of exposure that's that's um, pertinent to the asthma disease that I mentioned earlier on. We know there's a very high association of um, early life exposure to allergens with, with asthma. Um, and changing building design is causing this. And there are a number of things that are that are impinging on this. We've got a much higher level up now of composting, um, dealing with waste through composting sites that can potentially generate um, bioaerosols that might might may cause some degree of, of allergenic disease, and then we've got things like building events. And, and what we're actually showing here is is mold within buildings, 
um, that's thought to be associated with, with um, early life exposures and, and later development of asthma. And, and this is quite interesting from a number of perspectives. Um, and one is because um, we need to understand quite a lot more in a cross-cutting area about how building design affects this kind of exposure. Um, but also you can clearly see that this is due to a, an extreme event. So we're dealing with a, um, a, a climatic event here. Um, that this has been caused by a flooding event that's come up to this level here and, and left this mold level behind. But what we don't understand here is what the actual exposure is because one, it's easy to make an association um, with mold. What we really need to do is to understand the speciation and, and which species in case more, one species is becoming more prevalent. And, and we don't actually have good exposure measurements here or good exposure assessments in terms of what's actually happening here at the speciation level. And so this is one of the challenges um, facing us again. And, and so we have used, in fact, um, a new technology. And I just wanted to put in a couple of slides from some of our own work. Um, and this is one of them, um, where we've actually harnessed the power of new technologies to try and address this question of, well, rather than just looking at mold as a general, um, a general exposure level, what can we actually associate a particular species with, a, with an adverse outcome, in this case, um, uh, allergenic disease, so we can better perhaps address that exposure level um, rather than try, trying to deal with it as a general phenomenon. Uh, and it's particularly difficult to, to look at some mold species um, which could also be changing through climatic events as well. It's particularly difficult to look at some of these by microscopic um, and culture type techniques which can over represent some versus another. So we've harnessed new technologies here in this case um, proton release sequencing to actually sequence part of the genomes um, which starts to give us a, um, at least a qualitative measure on the types of, of um, species which are, which are present in some of these samples which we might take and can then underpin um, a molecular epidemiological approach where we can get a better measure of the exposure and start tie in with an adverse outcome and see whether, for example, change building design or altered materials are particularly altering one particular type of, of species and, and therefore maybe, maybe um, giving rise to, to uh, a, a greater burden of disease than might otherwise have been there. Um, so so these, this is one way of harnessing some of these new technologies and we need to see more of this as we start to, as we develop these in, in terms of using these technologies in public health. So that was exposure. So let's move on to hazard. And we've got all sorts of ways of assessing hazard. And most toxicology, toxicology regulation, at least in, in Europe, is, is hazard-based. And hazard's becoming much easier to, to look at, but not necessarily easier to interpret. And it's because we've got all these measures of things that which, which can change uh, what we're doing is measuring altered physiology in, in, in systems, altered biochemical events. And we've got a lot of new technologies that can give us a lot of um, measures in this area. And they're all tied together, of course, by adequate bioinformatics. Um, but this presents us with a challenge. So 20 or 30 years ago, perhaps slightly longer, we would have had one outcome to measure hazard. So, so perhaps we would have dosed up a set of animals with a chemical we would have seen how many had an adverse outcome, in this case they died, that we could easily measure. And we would be able to compare that with earlier chemicals and, and at least in this particular species, gain an understanding of what the uh, relative potency of that particular chemical was um, in terms of toxicology. Now that's become a lot more challenging. Um, because we can use one animal instead of a bunch, and we can measure a whole lot of different things. And here I've just take, just shown uh, gene expression data as one example. Uh, and interestingly, this gene expression data came straight out of a public database, so it's accessible by anybody. It's a freely available public database. And, and clearly, we can see here that we've got lots of different things going on, indicated by the colors in the, in the square boxes here. The question is, do these do these have any meaning in terms of risk? So, so we've got all these different measures. Do they actually um, constitute a change in? Uh, do they actually indicate hazard, or are they just a homeostatic response to that exposure that would actually resolve um, later on? And so, there's much more understanding here. Here, this is relatively easy to interpret. You can you can look at it very quickly. Here, we need a great deal more interpretation, a great deal more thinking 
to work out whether that particular area there actually indicates a hazard or whether it's just a homeostatic response in the system. So, so assessing hazard is becoming more challenging because we have all of these more the, these endpoints and which ones we use in order to to establish whether something's hazardous. And um, we can also use this in a positive way. And I rather liked this technique for a while. This was um, called connectivity mapping, and it was first developed at the Broad um, Institute. Um, and we and we used it a little a little further um, in some papers by myself and, and um, Shudong Zhang, who's now at the Queen's University in Belfast. And, and what we're doing here is assessing hazard by using all of this data, which we've had in this previous slide, as a as a set and looking at it. Um, against reference signatures. So essentially we're doing this, we're assessing this against other chemicals, but we're doing it with a much data, greater data set down here. So what we do is you, we take a, a gene expression signature here, this one happens to be from estrogen, and we have a lot of reference profiles in a data set. And, and then, then you have a, a mathematical algorithm, it doesn't really matter what that is at the moment, um, but we have a way of tying these together. and by tying them together, we can perhaps um, do exactly the same as we're doing here. Um, we can tie these together to assess hazard in a new chemical that we don't understand. So, so this is this is just one example. And so we've got estrogen here, which generates a gene expression signature of its own, and we match that back to the database. And rather interestingly, here you can make positive associations, and um, rather gratifyingly, the positive associations pull out estrogen receptor agonists, the kind of molecules which we might expect. But rather interestingly, you can also make negative associations. The negative associations are rather interesting because at least for estrogen, they come out to be all the estrogen receptor antagonists. So that, that provides rather a nice underpinning of this method that, that you can both get the positive associations and the negative associations. So we've got a way of um, looking at new hazard, uh, looking at hazard potential in new chemicals um, by matching it to old chemicals using the whole cohort of the new kind of data we can generate and also looking at perhaps um, uh, things that might mitigate that, that um, toxicity. So you might say that that's an easy example because we've got here essentially a molecule which interacts with the transcription factor and therefore will have a very defined effect on gene expression so it should be able to match really quite easily. What happens if we use a more generic molecule that isn't um, that has toxicological potential, but doesn't actually interact with the with the transcription factor. So it doesn't have a very defined what you'd expect to be a very defined effect on gene transcription. Well, here's my mitomycin C. So so we've got a genotoxic type chemical, uh, and if we um, if we put that into the database, and this is a um, a picture from some software developed by um, Shidong Zhang, which basically puts all the positive associations on this side and the negative associations on this side. Um, ranked by um, by significance, um, we can pull out um, other chemicals which which also cause um, genotoxicity. So we've got here a method which works not just for very defined chemicals working on transcription factors, but also seems to work on what you might call um, less defined chemicals, chemicals which might have a less defined effect on on gene expression. And we've now used this in a number of different scenarios, and it does seem to work very well. So it's it's one way. And it is only one way, but it's one example by which you can use this wealth of data you can generate to indicate hazard down here to actually to actually work out what that hazard potential might be by matching it to a database of pre-existing chemicals. Okay, so let's just go through here. Um, and then, of course, we've got model systems, and, and these are very important. And I'm just showing one here as an exemplar. Um, uh, so this happens to be a bronchiolar epithelial cell culture with dendritic cells that, that we happen to use in, um, with human bronchiolar epithelial cells to, to look at hazard potential of allergens. But, it, but it's just an exemplar of all the things that are now available to us. Um, we, can, we have nice model systems and that we need to develop them further. But we, we have a wealth of model systems which can give us good understanding of hazard potential, um, perhaps either in in vitro or in vivo by using um, all the, the different um, type gene uh, systems that are available there. And we've, we can make a lot of measures on these. So, so for example, we can measure all sorts of things that are changing downstream. So we can, we can get big data out of these. 
but it does drive forward as another challenge to make sure our model systems are appropriate. Are they, are they really appropriate? It's always been a challenge in toxicology making that jump from a model species, um, an in vivo model species to man. And that challenge is no less so in model systems to make sure they actually represent uh, the physiological systems that we're interested in. So to make them as close as possible to the human situation is, is going to be an ongoing challenge. But it's a very worthwhile one as we start to develop these model systems. And certainly, we need to put a lot more work into those to, to work out which model systems are the best to use in terms of understanding a toxicological hazard. And then we've got biomarkers. So biomarkers come out all the time. And biomarkers tend to be developed in the course of normal work as well as well as specific research to, to look for biomarkers. Um, this, this figure comes from a chapter that um, we've just um, published in a book um, that's been edited by, by Friedrich Fannekamp and, and, and Laura Suter Dick. Um, and it started me, they asked me to write a chapter on biomarkers, and it started me to think about where we are with biomarkers. And we've very traditionally tended to think about biomarkers in the present tense. So they are the markers of ongoing pathophysiological change in our traditional biomarkers of, of liver toxicity of ALT and AST, for example, are very good examples of this, that we measure them. And they're, they're a marker of something which we can't actually assess directly, except by making a biopsy, um, that we can't assess directly. So they're, so they're markers of a latent variable, but they're ongoing as a, they're markers of a, something that's ongoing in the present tense. And so we've got, we've got these, and we've got a lot more opportunity for new biomarkers in this area. Um, particularly metabolites and now the microRNAs are starting very much to to impinge on this and we're starting to see a lot more biomarkers of the present tense. But but biomarkers don't have to be just in the present tense. They can be past markers of historical events and exposures. And I think we're going to see a lot more in this area. And it's going to be very challenging in this area um, if we start to be able to assess past exposures as to what that means for future outcomes. And examples of this are particularly going to be changes in DNA. So we we know about DNA adults as markers of exposure to genotoxins, but I think there are changed epigenetic events as markers of, of not just that generation's exposure, but perhaps previous generation's exposure um, are, are going to start to to appear in toxicology and are going to be very challenging to interpret as to what that means for future outcomes. So, so we're going to have these biomarkers of past exposures, not just of a single generation. And then, of course, we've got future biomarkers, so predicting something that would be indicative, um, and particularly here polymorphisms, uh, structural changes in DNA and epigenetic changes. So as, we, as, we under, as the genetic revolution takes place and we understand a great deal about more, more about polymorphisms, what does that mean in terms of our susceptibility to chemicals? What might that mean in terms of what will happen to us in the future? And these are all biomarkers. So, so we're not just dealing with biomarkers in this present tense, but, but in the future tense and the past tense as well. Uh, and the rate at which these are developing, again, presents a very substantial challenge to the toxicologists, both in the public health and the pharmaceutical area. Again, just an, an exemplar from our own work, um, th this was a study we did with AstraZeneca. And again, this is a present tense biomarker. Um, but they were interested in, in the skin changes and associated with a particular drug. And we looked for the microRNAs in there um, as biomarkers. And, and two particular biomarkers show that very clearly is associated with pathophysiology that was occurring in this, in this area. So we have two biomarkers that were mechanistically associated with what was happening. Uh, and, and these were very easy in, uh, to, to detect using some of the high throughput sequencing techniques as well. Um, and, and we're going to see a lot more of these biomarkers. And, and recognizing those that are really valuable and taking them forward into validation stages is going to be uh, a particular challenge as well. What about actually um, testing and susceptibilities? So we've traditionally done toxicological testing in inbred strains. And there are very good reasons for this. They're homogeneous, of course, genetically homogeneous. And so they give us a much tighter uh, range of, of responses that we can better assess uh, by relevance of, of using smaller group sizes from a control to, a, to an exposed group of whether there's an adverse outcome from 
from a, from an exposure. But but I think we now we have to ask the question of whether they really represent uh, what we're going. So we're, we're faced with the challenge that if we use an outbreak population, we're going to get much greater variance here than we use an inbred population. So we traditionally use this inbred population. But we know there's problems with inbred strains of mice. They suffer from various uh, disease susceptibilities, and some of, some of them are shown here. So they already have um, some pre-existing underlying changes that, that may influence how they respond to a chemical. And we have to ask, us, I think, a very serious question of, of how relevant some of the inbred strains that we use are to the human population. Because we, as, we ourselves are not an inbred population, we are an outbred population. Uh, and so why would you use an inbred strain to test for a chemical which is essentially may, where the exposure of the population of interest is essentially outbred and has uh, a high degree of genetic variation which you don't find within the inbred strains and because of that that outbred nature suffers less from some of the um, susceptibilities that are found in inbred strains of mice. So, so we've got a model system toxicology challenge here and one area that I've been of interest in, I, I, it was presented by Jeff French at a HESI seminar um, about a year ago, and, and I've been watching this, and it's been developed by Gary Churchill at Jackson Laboratory. So these outbred um, strains, which have enough genetic variation to represent the human population, but are derived from a set of uh, eight inbred um, mouse strains, and, and with the advent of the DNA sequencing and the known sequences of these genomes, you can understand what uh, the genome is from these various outbred strains, which are clearly um, different here. Uh, and so they give us an opportunity, perhaps, to um, test chemicals for has a potential within a more relevant in vivo model system, and to understand the genetic variation that gives rise to to different responses within this outbred uh, strain, and, and then to go back to the human databases and ask whether that genetic variation is prevalent enough within the human population to, to in fact, give rise to a significant subpopulation that may respond differently were they exposed to that particular chemical. Uh, and so we've got these challenges ahead, and I think we need to think carefully about how we actually use both in vivo and in vitro models. So we've got lots of opportunities for models, both in these mice and in vitro models, as we've covered and perhaps in some of the gene mutant models where we know there might be a specific influence of a particular gene on, on a uh, risk potential, uh, to actually use these better in terms of understanding um, hazard and starting to assess chemicals better. Um, but again, the science runs ahead of our ability to validate and use these models and uh, presents a real challenge for the, for the toxicologist. The other challenge, and, and you would have all seen this slide before, that the, the DNA sequencing revolution, um, and this is why this is important, because um, from about 2008 onwards, the cost of DNA sequencing has been going down um, enormously. It's plateaued a little bit over the last few years, but nevertheless has dropped down to where, where we're, we're within range of that um, mythical, uh, not so mythical now, $1,000 uh, genome, human genome. Um, it can be realistically achieved. So, so this is this is giving us a lot more information about ourselves, and that information about ourselves is why um, this is so important. This is why we need to to do to think about how we're testing chemicals a lot better, and whether it's relevant to the to the human population. Um, and just as a, a slightly trivial but nevertheless um, important example of this. Um, th this chap, for, for those of you who don't know, is a, a famous rock star, Ozzy Osbourne, um, and, and he asked a very simple but nevertheless a very important question in about 2008, um, and, and I, this was published in a, in a national newspaper, um, and that's where I took this figure from. But he asked a very important question that he asked, a very simple but important question is, why am I still alive? So why am I still alive? Um, a, 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 on the face of it, a relatively simple question, um, but he was asking it because he'd grown or developed his rock star career um, with other contemporaries who were heavily exposed to various drugs, uh, alcohols, etc. And many of his contemporaries had died uh, over the years, and he was still alive. And he wanted to know why am I more resistant? Why am I why am I less susceptible? What's my background? Now, because there could be all sorts of, of reasons for that. His exposure may have been less. We don't have good adequate exposure measurements. But nevertheless, 
um, it, it, it gives us an interesting question. He, he, he sought to do this by using some of his money to get his genome sequenced, and, and this was back in 2008, so instead of costing $1,000, it cost him about $30,000, um, but nevertheless, a, 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 even then, a, a large sum of money, but, but one that many people could, could actually raise if they needed to. Uh, and what he found in his genome was that he had a number of um, aldehyde dehydrogenase polymorphisms and, and, and other things that could potentially give him a greater genetic resistance to the sorts of things he'd been exposed to. And the reason why I put this in here is because we're all going to be in a situation where we have the ability to know all or part of our genomes in, in the future. And as we get to know all of the part of these genomes, we're going, to, we're going to want to know how that contributes to our individual susceptibility or resistance to exposure to chemicals. And so it brings us back to this area here, is how do we assess um, what that, that individual susceptibility is going to be. And the only way I can see of doing this is to actually use relevant models and to understand um, the mechanisms of action of some of these chemicals so that when this data is available, you can start to actually look at the polymorphisms in the population and say, well, are they likely to be um, susceptible subpopulations? And we're getting that data, and that data is coming through very quickly. This just shows two of many worldwide projects that are using these technologies to understand more about our own genomes. So we've got one here, the 100,000 Genome Project. We've got a much bigger one called the Human Variome Project, looking at what the variation is in the human population. So we'll understand what our genetic background is and where the subpopulations are. What we need to understand is how that data influences the um, the risk to from from hazardous chemicals that we may be exposed to. Uh, and that's going to be important because we already see questions coming through, quite relevant questions asked very similarly to the way that Ozzy Osbourne asked his question of, do I have a greater susceptibility? Are there particular susceptible populations that might be out there? And do we need to adjust our risk assessments to take account of those susceptible populations? And one way of doing this is to understand the mechanism, understand the genes that are involved in that mechanism, and, th and then look to see whether there are polymorphisms that are prevalent for those genes in the population using these kind of data which are being which are being generated. So that brings us to the mode of action. So we need to understand more about the mode of action um, and the mechanism feeds into that of course. And again, all of these, these these methods, if we use them effectively, can start to give us much more information on that on that um, mechanism that that, that that runs from that joins together the hazard to the to the apical outcome. So we need to use these effectively in order to better understand individual risk um, within the population. Okay, so it's not it's not just genetics, and I wanted to push forward. So susceptibility can be driven by genetics, but also it's driven by other factors, and particularly early life versus late life exposures. So. Um, so, for example, in late in life, when when we've undergone various changes and and uh, perhaps our metabolic potential is or is not so good, or or our organ potential is not so good, we, we have individual susceptibilities, and and also at the early stages of life. So I've put asthma on here, but it's only one exemplar again, um, where we know there's an early life component to this. Um, so we've got early life organ development down here, which can influence susceptibility, but also two things which are now impinging in toxicology that we need to understand more about, epigenetic modifications and the microbiome. The microbiome I'm not going to go into today, but I think it's an important area for understanding early life susceptibilities and early life exposures and what the outcome is later in life. But I will stop to have a quick look at, um, at epigenetics in the, in the last few slides. Um, and, and one way that we're starting to look at this now is we need to understand actually more about what the exposures are in early life, both in utero and in neonates just after birth. What kind of things are they actually exposed to? Uh, and there are a number of projects now undergoing, uh, underway uh, throughout the world looking at this and to actually measure exposure using these fetal blood spots which are taken routinely at birth. And so at least we can start to get some kind of understanding of what the exposures are early in life. And then and then we need to, to through mechanistic understanding, tie in those exposures to whether there are susceptibilities that may be relevant both due to early life, late life, pre-existing disease or, or genetics. So we get to redefine risk a little bit. So we traditionally defined risk as 
a function of hazard times exposure. So hazard potential times the degree of exposure and and largely try to reduce risk by, by reducing exposure to a degree or using less hazardous chemicals. But what the new genetic information that we're getting now is really driving us towards is understanding risk by uh, a function of both the hazard and the exposure, but now the individual susceptibility. So this brings us down to a much more individualistic assessment of risk, at least to a subpopulation level. Are there particularly susceptible populations that need to be taken into account? Of course, we use our 10 by 10 factors to do this, um, so often starting from a nowhere, we'll say 10 times for for interspecies variation and 10 times for intra species variation. The question now has to arise is are they sufficient or are they overcautious? And as we start to understand more about genetics, I think we can we can do that better. Uh, and that is impinging on us to understand more about the mechanisms of action and tie that in with our knowledge of genetic variation in the population so we can better do risk on this kind of calculation. So this drives us to a whole level of science which has been coined with another omics phrase by um, Professor Colin Blackmore of Blakemore of the Medical Research Council, who's now coined the term populomics. Um, and this appeared in a report on public health in the UK that established us as Public Health England and, and gave us a a mandate to start to look at these these effects. And he, he puts down populomics to describe the crossover between the study of genetic and phenotypic diversity in the in population, how they interact with their environments, so that's all of our exposures, and how behavior affects, um, influences health and disease patterns. And a further mandate, which I'll just go on to now in the last few slides, is, an un, is he pushed forward to say that we need to understand how ge epigenetics and gene expression are related to inter and transgenerational uh, transmission of behavior and emotion and what does, it have, what does transmission have on behavior pattern effects in DNA. Uh, and this is really the, the whole science of, of epigenetics which has come to the fore particularly in transgenerational effects but is also um, important throughout our life and, and it's becoming clear now that, that evolution is not just driven by um, the relatively slow uh, selection of, ge of genetic polymorphisms but is driven much more quickly by acquired changes and these acquired changes are as a result of non-base pair changes in DNA um, and these are the epigenetic marks that we find on DNA. And some of these these studies have arisen from twin studies. So here we have a pair of twins, monozygotic twins, identical twins from uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, and, and again, just an exemplar that we find that what the twins start genetically identical at the start of life. And then typically over life, they'll, they'll develop some degree of phenotypic divergence. So one may become fatter than the other or, or develop some kind of um, uh, mental, um, different mental abilities, etc. So, so there's going to be some divergence over life, and and it's clear looking at the epigenetics, the environmental influences are affecting some of this, and and the environmental influences are driving um, some epigenetic changes on the DNA. So you get diversity in the epigenetic change over over life, and the important thing is that these epigenetic changes can be passed on to the children of these of, of these individuals, uh, as well as the children of, of um, individuals who are not part of a monozygotic twin set. So we've got the um, th the effect of environment on DNA, and the potential for that being passed down through through generations, so-called multi-generational and transgenerational effects. Um, and, and this just indicates how it can occur. I mean, this is, this is one genetic mark, and we won't go into this extensively today, but the methylation mark on DNA is very prevalent and controls gene expression and can be obviously, uh, has been shown to be affected by environmental influences, both chemical and physical. Um, uh, and this, this DNA mark is passed on and changed during the formation of our gametes. So in particular, during the formation of the primordial germ cell, the cell that gives rise to um, to the gametes um, pre-birth in females, but throughout life in males, which makes life in males particularly interesting in terms of um, 
environmental exposures and the effect of environmental exposures on the formation of the gamete. Um, the, the, these marks are erased and then re-established, and there's a particularly susceptible window, potentially susceptible window here, where these, where during the erasure and re-establishment of these marks in the gamete, um, there's a potential for um, environmental influences to affect that. Uh, and then these these marks are then passed on through the gamete on fertilization to the early embryo. Um, and, and, and also important in, in transmitting these effects are thought to be microRNAs and the so-called pre-RNAs that are found very extensively in the gamete and, and, um, and have a, a role in this process as well. And, and this is just influence here, and, and I, I particularly want to assign this slide to, to oh, so there's an extra E on there, but, uh, but, but Rene Regio Pierre of, of Stanford, USA, who again spoke at a HESI meeting in, in November, and I was particularly influenced by her talk. And, and also um, Dennis Noble, who I've heard speak a couple of times now from the University of Oxford. Um, he he has a website called The Music of Life, which you can find here, and there's um, a very elegant talk from him on that website if you wanted to go to that and have a look at that. And he talks about this, these early stages of life, which have particularly interested him in the latter stages of his, um, of his career. And, and he particularly um, makes this point here that we can take um, the nucleus from, a, from an egg and fuse it to the nucleus of a sperm, and, and, but deprive it of the cytoplasm that surrounds that, that fused nucleus. And you can put, but you can put it in a dish with, with all the relevant nutrients that it may um, require for starting life, and you can leave it and absolutely nothing will happen. Uh, and the reason that nothing happens is that we require not just the DNA, but the associated molecules contained in the cytoplasm of the egg of the sperm to actually kickstart life. So if you deprive the fused nucleus of those molecules which are in here, you, you don't get life starting. Um, and so what you need is for the fusion to occur to form an egg that also has the cytoplasm in it. And, and, and Rene, when she was speaking, made the point um, that, that transcription from DNA doesn't, in humans doesn't start until about the eight cell stage. So you've got to go from a fertilized zygote here, or a zygote um, from, uh, formed from the gametes here, to, to an eight cell stage on using the, the, the proteins and the molecules that are inherited from um, the cytoplasm of the egg and the sperm. So you're entirely dependent then kick-starting life on not just the DNA, but those, the, but those other molecules which you've inherited from, from your mother and your father, and they're going to have a profound influence on the on the starting of life here. And what we don't know is in this particularly susceptible window is, is could chemicals have an effect in this area? So one study that we did um, to, to actually just have a look at this, and this is purely an observational study, is we, we went to a local fertility clinic and we collected sperm samples from non-smoking and smoking males. Um, uh, and we just looked at the microRNAs in these sperm, and we know that microRNAs are important because they're important for some of the gene regulator effects here. We now know that, for example, that translation of, micro, of messenger RNAs occurs within sperm, um, so they're, and they're going to be important for translation of genes into proteins, particularly in this early stage as we go through to the eight cell stage. And we could, A, this was surprising for two reasons. One is that we could see effects of, of smoking that we could associate. Um, but but that B, that we could also detect these microRNAs very easily. Um, I thought they would be rare within the sperm. They turned out to be extremely abundant. So we don't know with these particular microRNAs whether these would have any effect um, that would develop a phenotype later in life. We didn't go that far. It's purely observational. But what we could see is there are clear changes in some microRNA species, some reduced in expression, some increase in expression um, between smokers and non-smokers. And the question has to be asked is, is what effect does that have, given that these are particularly important molecules on the gene transcription in these early life stages? Um, so, so what effect does environmental influence, does environmental chemicals have? Smoking, of course, being a big public health concern still throughout the world. Um, what effect does this have, not just on the, the generation that's exposed, but on the future generations that arise um, from those parents? And these are real challenges facing the public health toxicologists now to, uh, to get a better understanding of these things and, what, and what's the risk of these um, behaviors and these exposures in these, in these very early life effects. So we've, we've got a profound challenge here to understand 
the influence of the gene and the environment, and that that affects both how we measure hazard potential and how we start then to do to to look at risk and and is risk does risk need to be more individual, both um, in terms of a life stage, um, a future generation stage, and a, a, the current generation stage in terms of subpopulations. And it's rather nicely captured here by this quote from Marcus Pembry, who's a clinical gen geneticist at the Institute of Child Health in London. Um, and he's saying we're, we're changing the view of what inheritance is, so that you can't in life, in ordinary development and living, separate the gene from the environmental effect. They're so intertwined. And 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 with our greater understanding of the genome, that's that's not going to stop now because the technology of dry, of understanding the genome is driving ahead so fast. We need to really understand what much better what the influences are between the environment uh, and that genome, and start to get a much better understanding of that and whether that influences or changes our risk characterization of some of the things that we're that we're, we're exposed to and some of the chemicals and other influences such as physical influences from radiation or et cetera that are, that are in our environment. So big data, which is what we now call this, the, the colloquial term for all this big data is impacting on all areas of toxicology. It is impacting on both our assessment of hazards, right to our, to our assessment of exposures, tissue doses, et cetera, how we understand the perturbations at the biochemical level understanding how we how we measure um, morbidity pathways. We've got a particular challenge, I think, in differentiating um, morbidity pathways, even cell injury, from early cell um, changes. They're, in fact, just a, re a reflection of homeostatic capacity. And once the, the adverse effect is removed, we in fact, return to normal. And then a, an interesting area here that I think we also need to understand, and this is, this is particularly relevant to the epigenetics, is uh, do we have adaptive responses? Is it actually possible that as we um, interact with our environment and our environment changes, um, do we actually develop adaptive responses and, and can we actually reach a new state of normal that might not be regarded as, a, as a, an adverse outcome but is simply a, just a changed an adaptation, a new state of normal? Um, that effectively develops perhaps a, a state of resistance to whatever the environmental influence was that, that drove it in the first place. And, and, and the epigenetic changes that we're now starting to understand are very important in this particular area down here. So we've got big data. Uh, and said at the beginning, we've got, we, we can generate big data very easily. Um, we don't even have to do it ourselves. We can send samples out. We can get it done by service centers um, relatively cheaply now. Um, and that, that data is accessible to, to a lot of people. There's a lot of data online. People can easily get to it. You can get to it from anywhere in the world, any time of the day. Um, they can access data. But, but that doesn't necessarily need to lead to new knowledge or, or to improved well-being. And the challenge for all of us as, as toxicologists in, in all fields of toxicology is the interpretation. And, and it's this area here, this box of interpretation that's, that's where we find our challenge. It always has been a challenge. It's just becoming a bigger challenge now because we have um, this ease of, of generation of data. And we're being asked to interpret more quickly because people can access that data more easily. So we've, we've got a double, uh, a double hit here, both from needing to, to take on board more data and to actually interpret that much more quickly. But if we can do that effectively, it will lead to a greater understanding and a greater knowledge. So I, I've always liked this cartoon. I found it a few years ago now, um, but I think it, it rather captures this well. Um, the, the big big data does not automatically need, 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 mean new understanding. So here's the big data here. Um, but, but the challenge for this chap here is that, as the toxicologist is to actually interpret that data. And here's the person asking the question. So we, so we can ask questions much more easily, much more quickly. Um, and we can, we can have lots of data, but but for this this chap here, it's got the real challenge. He's the he's the public health or the pharmaceutical science toxicologist sitting here, and he's got to interpret this data to answer the questions from this chap over here. And instead of just being that amount of data, he's got this amount of data to deal with. So we we have a real challenge here, uh, and and it's one that's not going to go away. And we've all got to to work on this to 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 get to a better understanding of, of toxicology and a better understanding of risk. 
um, in an environment where data is not exclusive to those of us as, as scientists. So, so that's the end of the talk. So a very high level overview, which I hope has been understandable. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge Hesse for the opportunity to do this. So I'm sitting just south of, uh, to the west of London, south of Oxford in this, this centre here, um, which is a building on a large scientific um, park. Um, and these are some of the people who've looked at these slides and given me thoughts and reviews from my own um, department. Um, my previous existence at the MRC Toxicology Unit, Shudong Zhang for the Conductivity Mapping at Queen's University, Belfast, and two collaborators at um, AstraZeneca. So with that, I'd like to finish and, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for a very insightful presentation on current and future challenges of toxicology and public health. And now I would like to open this to discussion and question and answer. I hope you still have time for get the yeah, I, question. I just looked at the clock and realized I've gone slightly over time. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Didn't realize that went on for so long. Any questions from the audience? I have a question. This is Toshi Ishikawa from Japan. Um, I'm, uh, I, I, I uh, really thanks. A very nice uh, overview. And uh, I'm very much interested in the popularomics and uh, big data. Uh, if you are going to perform the population science uh, using the human subjects, how you can standardize the samples. And each individual has a different uh, lifestyle that the lifestyle could uh, affect uh, the, you know, um, uh, uh, the epigenetics uh, uh, factors and the uh, gene expression profiles and so on. How you can standardize such uh, uh, phenomena and also uh, which kind of samples you are going to investigate? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that is a, that is, um, a big question. <laughs> and um, I think the only, the only way I can see of going forward with that being is we, we can generate that data quite easily is, um, mm. is by understanding more about the mechanism. So, for example, if you understand that a chemical causes an adverse outcome by a particular pathway, Mm -hmm. You you know which genes are involved in that pathway, so then you can yeah. make an assessment of whether there are predominant polymorphisms in the population that perhaps affect the expression of that gene, mm -hmm. or even particular environmental influences that, that that affect the expression of that gene, but therefore may affect the way that that chemical interacts with that pathway and affect the adverse outcome. And, and I don't really see a, a way of of doing that any differently, um, mm -hmm. and the, 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 the if in terms of which samples you take, well, ideally you you'd want samples from the from the target organ, but that's not going to be the case. It, it may even be that we don't need samples from a at least for understanding the, the genetics, we don't need samples from population because that data is already out there in terms of big databases. In terms of understanding exposure, we're still going to need samples. Um, and therefore, there I think we need the better understanding of the mathematical relationship between blood and urine samples and, and levels at the target organ. So we can actually assess from a blood and urine sample what the exposure is at the target organ. And in terms of the genetics, we, we, we'll, we'll have information on the diversity of the population. So if we've yeah. got an understanding of the mechanism, we can, in fact, use the data that's already there to make an assessment of whether there are susceptible populations. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I think yeah. the, it is very important to, to um, get in, um, insight into the mechanism action uh, before yeah. doing the math. Uh, large, you know, uh, population science, but uh, we yeah, should certainly. have some focus on the subject, uh, which kind of the mechanisms are involved in. So that yes. uh, I agree with you, absolutely. I'd agree, yeah. yeah. But I think, uh, you know, uh, we, I was, I was attending an annual meeting of HESI and uh, we have discussed the, uh, some, uh, you know, genetic factors 
which is associated with the accessibility to the uh, toxicant or some uh, xenobiotics. So that uh, yeah. uh, it is uh, true that some small population are very sensitive or susceptible to the uh, uh, some uh, you know of the uh, xenobiotics. So that we need yeah. to understand which what kind of uh, uh, you know, mechanisms are uh, involved in such uh, um, reactions. Yes, certainly. Yes, and that maybe genetic is factors it? and the epigenetic factor may be involved, but um, we don't know at the moment. No, we don't. And and the, and the technology is driving ahead the yeah. the, da the, the the data generation without the data understanding, and that's, yeah, that's right. a, a real challenge. That's what you are doing. Yeah, right. and and then, and that then gives us, that actually then leads to a very interesting um, social yeah. and political dimension as well. That if you if you can actually identify susceptible population, uh -huh. how do you actually deal with that at a, at a social and political level? So um, yeah. yeah, yeah. In any case, uh, I wish you all the best and uh, great success. <laughs> well, I think it's going to take all of us. Uh, it's going to take a, you know, it's going to take the global population of toxicological scientists yeah. to, to yeah. really start yeah. to deal with this. Because it's, it's right. more than any one um, institute or person to deal with. All right, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I have another question. This is your yes. question from um, John Research Center, which is here in Europe. Um, thanks for the excellent talk. I think it was really great. Um, firstly, we could see that yeah, we will be able to say go. Hello? Okay, I couldn't hear that one. Could you speak? Could you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry, um, it seems like that the audio connection is not optimal. So maybe if there is any other question about the presentation, uh, you can either contact Phil or me. Uh, with the question so that I can forward that to uh, Professor Grant. And so, thank you very much for joining the webinar today. And then the HESI is also this kind of webinar, uh, particularly in once in two or three months. And we are hoping to ha have another one uh, before the end of this year. So please look for the uh, announcement. And I hope that you will join us again. And again, I would like to thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Grant for Jan for a wonderful presentation today and the, for the in audience for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Akio. Thank you. Thank you for everybody for joining us. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. There are two other callers on the call.